So my name is Dr. Jane Ellis and I'm Head of uh, Medical and Clinical Affairs for Lemira DX. And this morning I'm going to take you through um, an introduction to the SARS-CoV-2 antigen test. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. If you have the next slide, please, Mark. Um, so this is the um, Lemira DX diagnostic platform. So the Lemire DX Diagnostic Platform um, was designed by a group of entrepreneurs actually who have a lot of experience in the diagnostics business. Um, they are the same um, individuals who developed ALEA and also were involved in the development of the um, electrochemistry in the glucose sensing business that Medisense um, was built on. Um, so when they um, started developing the Lemire DX platform, the background was really to develop a point of care system that would meet all the requirements needed in the field um, for point of care. Um, because a lot of us had worked in the industry for many years and knew that there were lots of challenges. For example, you know, having the right diagnostic assays all on the same platform was really important, not having to have different systems for different types of tests you wanted to run, like infectious diseases versus cardiology versus diabetes. Um, obviously having laboratory performance is critical, so when you're developing and, and, and giving a, an answer for a diagnostic system, you need to be able to know that it's really accurate and we reference our um, tests all against um, a lab system. Um, and obviously have the quality oversight so that we can actually manage the instruments in the field remotely and that and users can be properly trained um, and quality controls are being run at the appropriate times that the instrument would have portable and seamless, would be portable and have seamless connectivity. So portability meaning obviously it's very lightweight. The instrument is um, about, uh, is quite small. It's about six inches long. It's quite light, weighs just slightly over a kilo. So it can be easily moved around. It can be operated from a battery that's rechargeable. Um, also, in, in a, and it has built-in Bluetooth that connect, can connect to Wi-Fi. So in, the data in the instrument can be uploaded um, into the patient's health record. It was important that users had one simple intuitive test workflow. The instrument has a touch screen so that you can actually um, easily operate it um, using a, a gloved hand. Um, and also um, the set, the, um, it's been designed so that the workflow is the same regardless of what tests are being run. So whether the test is running um, a flu test or um, a SARS-CoV-2 test or running something like a, a, um, a blood test for D-dimer, for example, that the way that you actually operate and run the test is, is very similar. And that means that users, once they're trained on the system, can easily be trained on the next test um, and, it, and it's not a, a complicated uh, process of training. Um, it gives fast results, so our systems are designed to deliver results as quickly as possible at the point of care, um, and that they run on a very small sample volumes, so designed so that if it was blood, it was a very small volume. But similarly, for a buffer sample, like with the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, it's a very small drop that goes onto the platform. Um, and the test strips are built on a very low cost manufacturing platform. So we have a state of the art system that can produce millions of tests that can run on this system. Can I have the next slide, please? So the Lemira DX platform, as I said, is composed of the instrument, but it's also composed of the test strip that you can see here. The one on the left is for INR, um, and this is a test we already have launched. And what we're able to do in our manufacturing um, process is actually design the strip for each test. So it has a unique design. Here for INR, it can just run one test in one channel that's running on the system. So measuring coagulation in patients taking warfarin, for example, so that they can be monitoring the, their drug dose. Uh, but uh, the one you see on the right shows an example of the type of um, system we use with the SARS-CoV-2 antigen test. And for this, we've got four lanes running, which means we can run more than one test at one time. Um, and also you can see it's very small. There's a little sample application area. The strip itself slips straight into the uh, front of the instrument here. So the test strip goes straight in there and the test strips are um, room temperature stable so they don't need to be refrigerated. Have the next slide please. The system itself is very easy to use. Um, here it's showing actually use in the lab but it can be used equally as I said in, in other settings. So patient ID can be scanned with a barcode scanner 
or you can input the patient details directly onto the screen. As I said, it's a touch screen designed very similar and in size to an iPhone. It, this screen then shows you animations. So you just follow the animations. So you open the door and insert the strip and the sample is applied directly when the instrument prompts to the test strip. Here it's showing your blood sample, but it could equally be a buffer extract that's been produced from a nasal swab um, from a, a patient that's being tested for SARS-CoV-2. The test asks you to close the door and then it starts automatically and it runs itself. And then the result is shown on the screen at the end um, of, of the test being completed. Um, you don't need to time the test and read it a certain time. It's very simple to use. And it stores the information in the instrument. It will star, store up to a thousand results in the instrument itself. Can I have the next slide, please? So this slide is showing you different types of settings in which the um, uh, platform has been designed to be used. So in a lab, but equally, it's very simple and we do have it used already um, in primary care, um, in care homes um, where, where elderly patients are. Um, also, we can see an example here of how it would sit very well in a, a more of a remote uh, clinic setting where you've got clinical visitors going out uh, visiting patients in their home. Um, also in pharmacy. And we've got an example here where it could eventually be used in the home, although we don't have any uh, work in that area at the moment, but the, the technology can actually be um, transformed into home use as well, eventually. Could I have the next slide, please? The way the connectivity works is that the instruments themselves are Bluetooth enabled. So the data from the instrument is transferred via either a connect hub, which is a little hub that fits into um, a wall in, in, a, in a clinic, for example, or via a connect app that can be downloaded and operates via a telephone or via um, an iPad. So the data can be transferred directly using our server system called Lemira DX Connect. The data is transferred to Lemira DX Connect, and from there it can be transferred into an electronic health system for the patient, for example, um, or it could be transferred to a laboratory management system that may already be in existence in the lab. Um, it also is able to generate data that can be uh, viewed with factory manager. So if there are issues with instruments in the field, we're able to view the data coming from the test strips and instruments and help our users in the field um, troubleshoot. Also on the bottom of the left hand side, you can see here that we have activity also in managing um, programs with patients. So in the UK um, and in Italy, we have a program called INR Star, which is an anticoagulation um, system which can do dose adjustments for patients who are taking warfarin and having coagulation management. And that uh, person can be monitored um, at home and they can have data transferred from being tested in the home by the healthcare professional up to that um, program. And that can also be implemented up and collected on um, the Mir DX platform and transferred to the patient's health record. Importantly, we can also monitor if the instruments are being used across a whole region, uh, we can look at um, help de develop population health analytics. If there are certain parameters of surveillance, for example, that are required to be captured. Can I have the next slide, please? So for Lemira DX and our SARS-CoV-2 test, um, you can see here that um, when you look at the normal development of infection of the virus, there's a period of exposure that's known. And this um, diagram is taken from um, Journal of the American Medical Association, a recent publication. And you can see here, the red line is showing you the actual virus um, infection and, and how it's being, got, how it kind of progresses. So the viral load increases and then over the next one to two weeks, we know that the viral load decreases and the period of infectivity is really in the first in 12 days of infection, 12 to 10, day, to, 10 to 12 days of infection. Um, so during that time also, you'll start to see um, PCR being, being able to detect the virus. But we know that PCR can detect the virus way beyond the point of infectivity. 
You'll also see that the antibodies, which are shown in the middle here with the two dotted lines um, for IgM and IgG also start to appear just after a week after infection. Obviously this is variable and depends upon the individual subject, but that's typically what is being uh, reported in the literature. So we see a period where we can detect the antigen, which is the red line, and then the period where the antibody becomes detectable. Of the next slide, please. So the Lemira DX SARS-CoV-2 antigen assay measures the nuclear protein using an amino assay. So it's using SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. And I mentioned that there's four channels on the test strip. Two of those channels are measuring the antigen assay and one of them is an onboard control. It means that we're actually running two assays for the antigen and we're able to mean those to produce a more precise and accurate result. Uh, we were able to use a test we were already developing. So when the COVID infection uh, and in pandemic started, we already were heavily involved in the flu um, test development. Um, we had trials running in the US and we already had an extraction buffer and a protocol um, that enabled us to already have the test architecture. So what we were able to do was very easily move the SARS-CoV-2 onto that assay. And it also means now that we can put the flu AB um, tests and the SARS-CoV-2 onto one test strip. And we're working on that at the moment. Could I have the next slide, please? So this slide shows the SARS-CoV-2 antigen assay process. So the sample that we use is uh, a nasal swab, the anterior nares, or we have recently also um, had data uh, collected and uh, that shows that the um, efficacy in nasopharyngeal swab also. We, we measure and we take the sample from the both nostrils in the anterior nares, so both sides, just basically turning the nasal swab around in the nasal passage on both sides. And then that's taken out and placed into um, our extraction buffer. Our extraction buffer is in a small um, dropper bottle that's provided with the kit. So here the sample is extracted, the swab is placed into it. It's held in there for a few seconds and then it's swirled around and then you hold the tube which itself is quite flexible and then pull out the swab. Then we have a dropper bottle, um, uh, um, a top goes onto the, um, the, the dropper bottle itself um, and that screws on and then it allows one drop of sample to be placed onto the test strip. The whole process here takes about a minute and then at the end the sample is dropped onto the strip and the test takes about 12 minutes showing the result on the screen as SARS-CoV-2 antigen positive or negative. And this shows you underneath here the kit that comes with the test strips, which I'd said all this is room temperature stable um, and the extraction buffers. Can I have the next slide, please. So the LOD, the limit of detection testing was completed when we were doing our um, study development for FDA submission and it was completed according to FDA guidelines using a gamma irradiated SARS-CoV-2 whole virus. Um, using a methodology that's set out by FDA we were able to show that our TCID 50 was 32 which was actually four times more sensitive than had been reported with other antigen tests. Have the next slide please. Our clinical studies for our antigen tests were run in the US and the UK, and we ran them on, in multiple sites, six sites in total. We used a drive-in site in Atlanta. We used um, a community site also in Atlanta, uh, where we had, these were both for people coming in who had um, symptoms, who would come into the site and be tested quickly and given their result back um, quickly. Um, and by the, the local standard of care method. And we were able to take two extra swabs. One was for our test and one was for our PCR reference. We've also run a number of other community sites in the US, which includes pediatric sites and family medicine. And in the UK, we used hospital sites. So this allowed us to have a final data set, which was the biggest one that had been presented. And it is still the biggest one presented to FDA of 83 positives and 174 negatives included in our study. 
could have the next slide please. What this slide shows is that we're able to measure the presence of antigen over a number of days since onset, up to 12 days. Whereas the other products, antigen products available that FDA have approved have a much shorter window, six or seven days typically. And this slide just shows you how the number of positives that were collected and how we collected them over the entire window of testing of 12 days and the total numbers of patients in that data set. If we go to the next slide, we can see the CTs. So this is the cycle time. So when um, a subject presents and has a sample that goes for PCR normally, um, the sample that goes into the PCR will go through a number of cycles, which we call a cycle time, in order to detect the virus. And the lower the number of cycles, the higher the viral load in that person. So you can typically see that when early on in infection, we see a huge array of different viral loads, different levels of infection within the individuals in our study. You can have someone presenting very early on, day one, for example, who can have a very high viral load with a CT that's about 17, and somebody that's also presenting around that time with a CT around 33. What's important with our assay is we could see across the entire range of the first 12 days, all of the red um, squares are positive results on our antigen test and the two that we missed you can see are the blue um, circles at the top and these are um, ones where we have the cycle time over 33 which means that they are very low uh, viral load individuals in, in those uh, cases. What was important as well is FDA hadn't seen this type of data before um, and it was really interesting to them um, to look at how the, uh, the disease um, presents itself in different people in days since symptom onset. If we go to the next slide, we can see how this looks in terms of sensitivity. And what we find is here, you can see the amount of PCR positives versus the Lumira DX test that were actually detected on every single day um, of that window of symptom onset up to the final a number of 83. And how the sensitivity at the beginning was 100%, and how then you can see we're still at 98% for most of the testing window, and it drops to 97.6%, which is the claim we make in our product insert for the sensitivity or the agreement against PCR of the method. So our overall um, data shows that using a nasal swab, which is a very simple um, way to collect the sample in the interior areas at the front of the nose, having collected 83 samples, we had a positive agreement against the Roche-Cobas, which is our PCR method, of 97.6 and a negative agreement of 96.6. And what we found was that for CT, so the Roche-Cobas CT value, if it was less than 33 or equal to 33, we had 100% agreement with that method. So we had a high level of sensitivity across the whole range and we have the widest window and the highest sensitivity claim of any of the products approved by FDA. Have the next slide, please. And this just shows you the competitor comparison where you can see the reported sensitivity of each of the assays approved by the FDA. Um, the number of positive samples, you can see by far we have the biggest sample set of any of the data that's been presented to FDA. We also have the widest window collecting and being able to present results over the first 12 days. So we have a much bigger opportunity to test patients than a lot of the other products in the market. And also importantly, we have the lowest limit of detection, which means we have the most sensitive assay and able to find those individuals um, with much more accuracy um, than when the other assays. Could I have the next slide please, which um, is showing the COVID-19 infectivity testing. So this is data that's being reported in the literature now. There's a lot of interest about when individuals are infectious and when are they no longer considered infectious. And what we can see here is the viral load um, from patient data um, being presented and the predicted infectiousness, which is the black line, declining as you get the days from the when symptoms first develop going down to, to zero. 
um, and also the rate of positive culture. So the green line is actually a positive culture being produced by the virus. If you actually take a swab from somebody and then try and culture it. What you can see importantly is that we cover the period of infectivity of the individual. You'll still be able to detect a PCR positive, which will be remnant RNA um, in, in the nasal or nasopharyngeal area of somebody, perhaps at day 16 or day 20. But there is real questions amongst clinicians now about whether that how that relates to infectivity. And perhaps the first 10 to 12 days is the most important period to be detecting individuals. If we go to the next slide, this shows user feedback. So we have run multiple studies on our antigen test and also our antibody test. Um, and have had a lot of feedback from users. As I said at the beginning, we designed the system to be very easy to use. And this is what we get back from our users. It's very easy to use, very simple. The portability is highly important because it can be taken out to sites, as I said, in drive-through centers or out to clinics, out to homes. It's very convenient, um, uh, very fast gives a standing performance, has a very simple workflow and a very quick turnaround time. It's very simple to clean and very and we, produces very little waste. That little strip test strip is, is very simple um, to dispose of. There's, there's very little waste generated. Um, and we're also um, involved in studies at the moment looking at asymptomatic um, screening use uh, for the system also. So I think that was my last slide. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, for coming through with the wonderful presentation. So Dr. Jane Ellis is the head of clinical and medical service at Lumira DX. Uh, and we are glad to have them here, uh, giving us an overview of uh, their uh, Lumira uh, DX platform, as well as the SARS-CoV-2 antigen assay uh, that they have run. Uh, we acknowledge the questions and comments uh, that came through the chat. Uh, thank you for keeping them coming. We shall be now going into that question and answer. Just a reminder, uh, we have simultaneous language interpretation, uh, French uh, to uh, English to French. So feel free to choose the language uh, of your choice uh, from, from, the, from your screen. Um, let me take uh, a couple of questions, quite a lot of them came through. Uh, interesting questions indeed, uh, from sample types to issues of performance, uh, issues of sensitivity, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, interesting also uh, when you also talked about uh, connectivity. So we shall touch those as we, as we go. So uh, let me start uh, uh, quickly, I think, since this was uh, initially uh, um, mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, and it had to do with uh, the issues of the data storage and uh, the, the connectivity. Stuart nice, uh, Knight says, uh, where is patient data stored? Is it on servers uh, outside the host country? Does Lumira have rights to data use? Mark, do you want to answer that or do you want me to answer that one? So I'll, I'll answer the first part of that question, Anafi. So the Thank data you. is um, sent to the cloud and then stored in the Amazon warehouse that has just been launched in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, from a factory manager perspective, we don't get to manage any of that um, patient specific data. Uh, that would be purely for quality control purposes. Thank you, Mark. Um, so do you, or you, you mentioned it's, you don't actually own the data. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I also want to take a question from um, Obed uh, Nuagira. And Obed says, how are the results displayed on the screen? It shows positive. Does it show positive or negative? He wants to know how exactly is the result displayed? Um, yeah, so it just sh shows positive or negative uh, for that patient. That's all. There's no other um, indication. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And moving on, quick two quick questions uh, from Hannah uh, Kimenju. And Hannah says, does it require electricity? 
Can you use batteries? There's a rechargeable battery in the instrument. So you can mm. plug it in and charge it up and then you can take it out and use it in the field. So you do need electricity to be able to charge it up and it can run from mains plug-in or as I said, it has a rechargeable battery um, that runs a number of tests if you're using it remotely. Okay, thank you. Maybe I may just also add there, do you have an estimate of how many tests you can be able to run or how long it can be able to stay on battery? Um, it'll obviously depend upon each situation, but we can run 20 of these antigen tests um, on one um, complete battery charge. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, questions keep on coming, uh, and uh, the one that I'm touching on here maybe is a representative of those, uh, or Devi has also asked about battery life, I think that has just been also uh, uh, responded to. Um, do you need a BSC, a biosafety cabinet? I think that was a question from one, one of the uh, uh, audience. in terms of safety? So no, I think it's a normal, um, your normal risk assessment. So you would do a normal risk assessment for um, taking the sample. Mm -hmm. So it's the same um, ap approach you would take to actually swabbing the individual, taking the sample um, and then extracting the sample. Um, so you quickly extract the sample and pop it onto the test strip. Okay, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, quite a number of questions also came through uh, with uh, respect to the sample type. Um, and I want to combine those questions together with the issues of sensitivity and specificity. So maybe let's start with the, well, what is the uh, recommended sample type? Somebody asked, can you use blood for this? No, um, for the antigen test, you need to use a nasal swab. Mm -hmm. So that's swabbing both um, sides of the nose. Um, mm -hmm. um, that, so no, it's not a blood test for the antigen. Okay. Then in terms of, um, okay, maybe let me take this one from Stephen Balinda, Balinadi. And Stephen says, <clears throat> has this test been evaluated on asymptomatic persons? I think he's trying to take from, I think, the initial graph that you showed where you had indicated uh, sensitivities and the days of onset. The original cohort um, of study that we ran did include some asymptomatic subjects, yes. So we, mm -hmm. have, um, we have tested on asymptomatic subjects also. Okay, and any... We, yeah. we have some work still in progress on that at the moment, I would say. Um, what we tend to see is that, and what other people have reported, is that the range of um, cycle times, if you like, um, levels of virus in asymptomatics is, has an equal um, spread of, of, le of levels, as you see in symptomatic subjects. So, um, but, uh, but we have done some testing on asymptomatics. That's still in progress. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Along the same lens, uh, possibly or not, uh, I think there is a question from Willy Sengoba, who uh, wants to know, will the Lumira DX antigen test result um, include CT values? I'm sure you've answered that for positive values. Uh, also wondering the capacity of testing multiple uh, pathogens without loss of specificity. And he, I think he also wants to go on and ask about cross-reactivity. So maybe let's break that down. Uh, I know you indicated uh, some results where you showed that sensitivities were almost about 100% at CT values of less than 33. Yes. Uh, what you have indicated that, um, yeah, I think he is asking about uh, any inclusion of CT values somehow, maybe in the back end or something. Um, no, um, the um, CT values obviously um, are in our system are referenced against the Roche Cobas. We don't mm -hmm. present any CT values. In, in the result, if, if that's what's meant by the question, we yes, just produce exactly. positive or negative. We are in the process of publishing um, our data, so that will be more, um, be able to read that in more detail. Thank, thank you once again. I think uh, a lot of questions keep coming. Uh, I see, um, okay, 
uh, chances of uh, what antigen is detected and what chances are what are the chances of cross reaction? I know you touched on this a bit, but maybe to just clarify for those that uh, might have joined a bit late, what sort of antigen is being detected here? So we, we are detecting the nuclear capsid protein, which is inside the virus. So one of the first steps is that the detergent in the extraction buffer, um, you know, makes the membranes leaky so that the assay can actually um, access the nuclear protein, so it's inside the virus. Um, and then we've done extensive stud cross reactivity studies. So in order to achieve the emergency use authorization from the FDA, we had to challenge the test with multiple different types of um, samples from other, um, in, you know, other infections, other infectious agents. That's all listed in the product insert, um, which um, can be shared if that hasn't um, been shared already. And so it's been extensively tested with, with many other potential cross-reactants and also endogenous cross-reactants, um, such as types of medicines that individuals might be taking um, who have those types of respiratory symptoms. And, and everything was all um, negative. There was no cross-reactivity. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, I see questions keep uh, flying in. Um, and there was a question around uh, the issues of regulatory approvals in the EUL. Uh, maybe you can clarify on that. Whether you uh, whether this one has already been listed uh, and on which other uh, major regulatory bodies have, have, have approved this test for, for emergency use. Um, so, so I'll, I'll, sorry, go ahead, Mark. You address the EUA first and then I'll speak to the EUL process that we're in. Okay, so we submitted our data to the FDA and achieved emergency use authorization in August of this year. Um, so we are approved by FDA, if you like, for, for use in the US. We also have the CE marking, so we're, we can, um, we're approved to um, sell the product and, and use the product in any of the countries that um, follow that uh, CE marking um, designation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you wanted to come through. Thanks, Anafi. Similarly, we've um, submitted um, to the WHO for EUL. Um, that process was started about a month and a half ago, and we expect it to be concluded by the end of this year. Thanks again. Um, moving on, uh, I think we want to touch the issues of controls. Um, I see quite, 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 quite a number of questions also around controls. Is there any control and how, how is it, uh, what is the control strategy within the samples, within the, the assay? Yeah, so we produce positive and negative controls in a kit that you can purchase with the assay. Um, it's a uh, liquid and it's inactivated virus produced for us by a company in the US. Um, and it's very simple to use. It's just a little drop onto the strip um, that runs and obviously confirms um, the uh, positive or negative um, accuracy of, of the test. Okay, thank you. And, and just to maybe uh, just make sure we clarify this, and you had indicated that when you see the result, it's written either positive or negative. Does yeah. the user have, have an ability to see what the control result is or this is all behind? Yes, it will just say pass or fail on the screen for the quality control. Come again, sorry, I missed it. The quality control. So if you run a quality control on the strip, it will either indicate that it has passed or it's failed. So inside the um, instrument, it will have parameters set for um, knowing whether the quality, where the quality control um, results should be, if you like, in terms of signal mm -hmm. intensity. Yes. Um, and it will indicate whether that has uh, passed or failed on the screen. So there's no user interpretation needed. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, moving on, um, I think uh, most of the, the samples that we collect are usually collected in VTM. And, 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 and Terida is asking how long is the window period for samples stored in buffer until the test get a valid result, is it evaluated for samples stored in VTM? 
So we don't make any claims for VTM, but we do have a um, laboratory evaluation protocol um, for that, that can be used just to assess um, the sample, which is a swab dip method, which we share with we can share with um, customers interested in evaluating the product. Um, we don't, as I said, you don't we don't have a VTM claims, so you cannot use VTM on a custom on a patient sample. Um, on, on the strip and, and give a result to the patient. It's purely for a, a laboratory test. Thank you. Thank you once again. And, and the other question was on the extraction buffer, I think. the um, yes. So once the sample has been put into the extraction buffer and the extraction process is completed, um, you have five hours, a five hour window mm -hmm. in which to run the test with that extraction buffer. And then we recommend that you freeze the sample. You can freeze the sample and then you can store it and, and run it later. Oh, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Dian Waku, I think he, he or she has tried to come back the, to the question of controls again uh, that I asked Erin, and uh, is looking for for a, wants to know: Do you have to run these controls in parallel, or like for each sample, or is it a separate run? How exactly does it work? Okay, so the system has many built-in controls. So mm -hmm. each time a sample, an, an instrument, the instrument has for the test strip, it's already running multiple controls on the system. When the sample is run, we use microfluidics. So at each step of the testing process, the instrument and the software are making sure that the liquid is where it's supposed to be, etc. So it's got lots of what we call error traps built in to make sure that there's no there's never a result reported back that's due to some issue with the way that the sample has run on the strip. So that's something to know that there's always lots of controls and testing happening every time a sample's being run on the strip. And separate to that, then yes, we offer external quality controls, which are just run according to the local clinical or hospital guidelines, which might be once a week or once a month or when a new um, strip lot of test strips um, is being used or when a new user is starting. So usually the quality control procedure is down to the local hospital or, or, um, or lab or, or clinic who's using the system. Thank you very much. Um, just moving on, uh, given that the, there is an instrument here and, and a test kit, um, I picked one question here, which, which is uh, related to diagnostic integration, which is one of the key things that we feel uh, could be key in most of the time uh, responding to, to pandemics. And um, this is from Camille, and Camille is asking, can we be able to use this platform for some other molecular testing uh, for nucleic acid detection? Or it, it is only for, 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 for SARS-CoV? Can it be used for any other? Jane, I'll, I'll tackle that. And Afi, yeah. so prior to COVID, we had a, a program that we were launching to Africa to focus on primary care programs, developing our platform um, to, to provide diagnostic um, solutions in, in Africa in decentralized settings. Uh, and COVID's given us a near-term opportunity to, to focus our efforts on bringing a, a COVID asset to the market. Um, but part of that primary care solution incorporated a number of um, assays in the pipeline, including HbA1c for um, diabetes monitoring and diagnosis, um, CRP, D-dimer, and then in partnership with the Gates Foundation, a program to bring a number of infectious disease amino assays um, into the Africa market, all operable on, on this platform, with a long-term view of developing um, an assay as well, which is, is due for release um, over the course of next year and into 2022 um, that would have molecular capabilities um, addressing some of the high burden diseases that we see in Africa. So that would be a molecular assay for HIV, for TB and for other, uh, other infectious diseases. So that is the, the, the long-term plan of this um, platform in Africa. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'd also want to acknowledge, I think, quite a number of questions uh, around the issues of course that are coming through. Uh, however, on this platform, we try as much as possible not to delve much into the cost elements 
uh, and we try one. We want to try and only so stick to issues of technical issues, so that the other issues of cost and uh, sort of marketing can be dealt uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, with uh, with the with the suppliers, uh, whom we are also happy to give their contacts uh, here. However, in terms of uh, the global agreement uh, that we uh, also had a session on. Uh, some couple of weeks back, the one that was launched on the 28th uh, of September this year, uh, I think uh, uh, global partners have agreed with uh, key uh, manufacturers uh, that, that, that had uh, devices and instruments at that time to start the, the antigen test at five US $5 uh, per test. And as we had in that other session, I think there are uh, we are also hopeful that this will continue to go down so that we can reach as many places as possible. Um, maybe if we move on to other questions that are, like I had said, maybe more technical and uh, other related questions. Um, I can't remember who that is, uh, but uh, he or she was asking that you mentioned the test is, you can get a result uh, from one to 10 minutes. And uh, if I remember well, uh, he or she had said he, she doesn't understand how you can get a result in one minute. Maybe can you explain yeah. how you reach the one to 10 minutes? Yeah, sorry, maybe that was unclear. When I presented earlier on and I talked about the concept of the platform, we were talking about how some tests like INR, for example, coagulation mm -hmm. can run in as little as a minute to 90 seconds. But for the SARS-CoV-2 antigen test, it's a set um, time frame of 12 minutes. So each different test we design for the platform will have a different amount of time it takes. But certainly for the antigen test, once you put the sample onto the strip, it takes 12 minutes to run and produce a result at the end. It won't show a result any earlier, even if it's a very strong positive, it will always take the same 12 minutes to run. Thank you for clarifying that. So there you go. It takes exactly 12 minutes and not one to 10 minutes. Uh, it was important to clarify that. Uh, we know we're just about to reach the end of the hour. Um, Silva says the device cassette loads four samples at a time. So his question is, if he has few samples uh, coming in a time, can you use one cassette and run, say, two tests, as well as uh, and keep the other two wells for, for later use? No, sorry again if I was unclear. You can only run one patient test per strip. The strip has got four lanes inside it, but it's running the same patient sample in every single lane. And it's mm -hmm. using two of those lanes to produce two antigen tests results. And from what that it takes the mean. One of those lanes, it runs an onboard control. So we have a control immunoassay just checking that the fluidics are working properly. And then the other lane in, in this case is, is not used. So our tests at the moment are designed solely for using one patient sample per test. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And I also want to take uh, this as one of the last few questions that we we have. We talked about controls. Anything around calibration? So when the, the lot of test strips comes in its box, there's a lot calibration file in the uh, wall of the box. And um, if you look on our website, actually, there's a video and it shows you how to do the calibration transfer. So you just literally hold that box up against the instrument and it, it transfers over um, by near field connectivity. So you literally just touch the box onto the, um, the test strip onto the side of the platform and that takes over the calibration instantly. That will then run all of the tests on that lot. So it could be that you have a number of boxes of the same lot and they will carry on using it. The instrument always knows if it doesn't have the calibration for that particular lot of test strips. It's got a little um, 2D barcode on the underside. So it knows what lot it's looking at when it expires. So it will never let you run a test from beyond the expiry date. 
and it also knows if it's got the lot calibration for that lot of test strips. If it hasn't, it asks you to do that process of just touching the box to the side of the instrument and then it's already in there. So it's very simple um, to do the calibration uh, transfer per lot. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we are left with about one minute. Uh, so maybe one of my last few questions would be, um, are these tests already available in the market now? I think that was a question that came through. Nafi, thanks for that question. So we will be making the instruments and tests available on the Africa Medicine Supply Platform, MSP. Um, mm -hmm. We have um, a go live date over the course of next week. Um, that will be made available by donation and partnership with the Gates Foundation um, to all Africa Union member states. Um, and the allocation on a country basis will be administered by Africa CDC. So if, um, if there are any Ministry of Health uh, customers or, or potential uh, people on the call, they would be able to access the instruments and tests of the AMSP site over the course of next week. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark, for, for that. And uh, indeed, we, we had a session where we also had the Africa Medical Supplies uh, Platform coming through and uh, indicating how this is going to be going on. So we are glad, I think, uh, uh, that this is moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, we have reached the end of uh, the hour. Uh, we acknowledge that we started a little bit late. Uh, apologies for uh, for, 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 for that uh, and uh, all the same, we appreciate you for being patient with us and staying uh, long until um, the, the end of, of, of the session. I just want to uh, give um, um, our presenters a few seconds to, to chip in with a few remarks. There are quite a lot of questions and uh, also acknowledge questions around LOD in terms of genomics. Uh, which, which has been mentioned as the easiest way of comparing to PCR uh, that uh, Lee Schroeder has mentioned. So we will ask uh, Dr. Jane and Mark to uh, kindly help us move with some of the written responses that we can be able to share uh, as we share with the, uh, the slides as well as the recording for this session. Uh, Mark, any 30-second uh, uh, remark to, to close this? Absolutely, thank you, Nafi. So, so as I said, we start, um, we go live on MSP next week. Built into that is a, a very well-defined implementation process um, that incorporates our learning management system and a, a number of other exciting features to the program. So, we look forward to um, to continuing this discussion um, with with the different ministries of health on on this uh, webinar session. But I think if you could just share all of the questions that have been sent through, and I've been tracking some of them. Um, I'd be happy to share them with uh, Dr. Ellis and respond, um, you know, as, as soon as possible. Um, and, and we're very happy to get back to the, the senders of those questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, in 30 seconds. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Um, it's been enjoyable, some excellent questions. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have or any, anything that was not um, clear during the presentation. So thank you very much for your time and your patience. Uh, apologies for the problems we had at the beginning. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, we also appreciate you, uh, uh, your resolve in trying to connect despite the challenges. Uh, and uh, I'm glad we eventually managed to have the session go on uh, uh, despite what happened earlier. Uh, colleagues, let, allow me to also thank uh, our presenters uh, for uh, coming through and sharing with us um, the Lumira DX uh, platform, as well as um, the antigen uh, uh, assay that is run on the same platform. We will continue uh, uh, coming to you with uh, these sessions dedicated to um, the fight and particularly with respect to diagnostics. We are looking forward to our next session, uh, which is uh, likely to be on uh, uh, pulling uh, as a technique to efficiently uh, uh, do as many tests as we can with our uh, little resources. So look out for uh, the advert for that session, uh, which shall be coming soon. Till we meet again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.